actual shape of it. But this view, we need to have three phases of everything. Then we uh, find this, the three quarter view. It shows two phases. It, keep, it keeps its top, top view and the uh, side view. Um, and then I made a 3D model, which is this, this one. In the 3D model, I just screenshot from the side top and uh, down. So when the rower goes left and right, top and down, we can have a good reference of it. And then we come up with this design. But in this design, everything uh, looks too red. Then later we just made some color adjustment, make the rover give it more like silver tone, make it more like matches more with the actual rover. And that's the art process. Then, yes. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, over the course of this project, we were trying to balance the scientific accuracy um, and the great complexity of making a rover that is launched from Earth to Mars um, and then is programmed entirely remotely. Um, and also trying to make something that's entertaining and fun for kids to play because our target audience is um, students. And uh, we're trying to excite them and get them to develop an interest in um, programming and computer science, um, as well as interest in NASA and space in a lot of ways. Um, so that, that required us to make some decisions, for example, in portraying the rover. We wanted the rover to be as accurate as possible, um, but there was no way to depict every single facet of the rover. Um, it's the size of a car uh, in, in real life. Uh, it doesn't always look that way. It looks kind of small from pictures, but it's the size of a car. Uh, and so there are a ton of instruments packed into it. So we had to kind of abstract it down. We couldn't portray every single instrument. Um, it's the same with the idea of the sample and the cache. Um, so what the Perseverance rover is going to do is uh, it's going to find samples from the surface of Mars uh, that it thinks might contain uh, evidence of life on Mars or other information that might be useful to NASA scientists. Um, it places those samples inside of a tube uh, and then it leaves them in a cache spot for later missions to pick up, presumably manned missions to Mars. Um, so this was a little bit difficult for us because we didn't know what the cache looked like at first. And then as we started to do research, we realized that as far as we could tell, the rover just like leaves the samples on the ground. Uh, and so we were like, well, that's not a particularly interesting visual. Um, so what we ended up doing was just having a little circle that says cache. And uh, obviously it's not gonna say cache the rover on the surface of Mars, um, but that was what was necessary for us to depict the location in the game and make it clear to the player where they're supposed to leave the sample. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we had facts that would uh, catch the player's interest. And so we end up having two different kinds of facts that pop up. The first is uh, what we're calling far off facts and they're just general facts about Mars. Um, they're not necessarily related to the rover. Um, like this first one displays at the first level, um, Mars is called the red planet because it's regolith, which is its surface material, is full of rust colored iron oxide. Uh, and so these are just little factoids that we think are um, explaining something about Mars um, or are going to pique the player's interest. And then at the end of the level, um, we present another fact that has something to do specifically with a rover and something um, that we, that as far as NASA knows is true about the samples that Perseverance might pick up. It's a little hard because this is all theoretical Perseverance has not actually been to Mars yet. All of the information that NASA has and that we have as citizens and designers um, is from previous missions um, and ongoing missions that don't have as sophisticated instruments. Um, so we try to use the information that's all out there already. Um, and so we wanted this to be kind of like a reward to the player for finishing the level. Um, and the player gets a score is not gonna be zero. 
presumably. Um, and then there are three different levels of achievement that the player can have. Um, the first one is awkward analyst. The second is passable programmer. And the last and best is stellar scientist. And uh, that depends on how well the player does and how few times they have to send strings of information to the rover. Um, and the more mistakes they make, the, the more likely they are to get a lower level. So it encourages, it, we don't punish people or, or prevent them from going on to the next level, but it encourages you to do it again and try to um, be more precise. Uh, we were really lucky to partner with Ryan Grant Powell, who is a student at uh, NYU Steinhardt. Uh, we reach out to a class at Steinhardt that does uh, film and game design comp uh, composition. And uh, he made all of the music and sound effects that you heard in the trailer at the beginning of our presentation. Um, I can't recommend him enough. Uh, he did a fantastic job on, on the audio. Uh, so we also wanted to talk a little bit about upcoming features and things that we would like to do next. Um, we discussed with our clients the possibility of including Martian dust storms and um, the gameplay there would be that the storms are coming from a specific direction and so you know what direction they're going in and you have to tell Perseverance to hide behind obstacles in order to not get covered by uh, dust and mired in dust, which is actually what caused the Opportunity rover to stop broadcasting signals back to Earth, is that it was stuck in a dust storm. Um, We've put a lot of work into this and, and um, fixing bugs um, and making sure that it is playable. It could be ready to go on Ology at this point by next week. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty complete the way it is. Um, but if you would like to see it for yourself, uh, feel free to email me at the email address in the slide. Uh, we have posted the demo of the game on itch. It's password protected. Um, and I will give you a link to the demo as well as the password that you will need to play it. So uh, that is all. But before we end, we just want to thank first and foremost our clients for their invaluable feedback, uh, Karen, Lizette, Pierce, and Soleil. Um, we also are incredibly grateful to Matt as well as Greg and Deborah for being guest speakers. Uh, and again, we're very grateful to our musician, um, to everyone in the class for their great feedback, and to our families and friends for being really supportive during this time of pandemic. Uh, we may not be together, um, but Perseverance is also not going to be with the people who created it when, when it's on Mars. And that's okay, and that's a good and hopeful thing. Uh, so thank you all very much. Great job, team piloting Red Rover. Uh, now, uh, if there are questions from the audience, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask your questions now. Go ahead, Eric. Um, thanks for a really, uh, really great presentation, interesting project. Can you tell us a little bit more about just how the gameplay works? I think it was, I don't know if it was because the end of the video became obscured by other windows or, uh, or I missed it, but I, I just to, uh, I, it's not clear to me what, what the gameplay is, the core gameplay. You're programming in moves and- yeah. The video did cut off. Um, we can play it again. I, I don't Why know. don't you just tell me how the gameplay works? That's okay too. Okay. The program moves in in advance, so you're just you're plotting a course. Yeah. So uh, if you look at that sample image from the video, um, you have a interface down in the bottom right, and it has directional buttons, um, and you can tell the rover to move forward, backward, turn right, or turn left. Uh, pick up the sample, which is the object that is highlighted in glowing blue, and drop it off at the cache site. Uh, and then put those commands together in a string. Maybe you want to mute the video if you're going to play the video while it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you put those commands together, and then you send it to the rover. Uh, and then the rover will execute that list of commands. Uh, if you've put in your commands correctly, 
then it will um, move to the sample, pick up the sample, and then drop it off at the cache. Uh, if you've sent an incorrect list of commands, it will get off somewhere. It might run into the edge of the grid, or it might run into one of the obstacles. Um, and so you'll have to send another set of commands. But what would um, make what would make someone make a mistake? I mean, it seems fairly rote, right? Is what is there anything that gives the gameplay more depth than than just plotting a course up left, down right? Are there dynamic elements or m things that might or might not happen or anything like that? So it's kind of a visual puzzle. Um, okay. The, the controls are specific to the rover. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to keep the rover's orientation in mind as it's moving around the grid. I see. Um, and think about, like, if, if the rover has been oriented, for example, in this video, so that it's moving downwards, you still have to hit the go forward arrow, not the go backward arrow, uh, to because the, the arrows are all relative to the rover itself. Understood. Um, OK, so it's thank you. Like, yeah, it's like programming itself. You have to put these little blocks together. Uh, thank you. Yeah. I just have a, a comment. I think the uh, the introduction of the storm. I think you know. I, I was in one of the early meetings about this, and I think you know it's. An interesting sort of intro to programming paradigm that we've seen but like the storm idea is kind of neat the, the fact that you would have to like have a primary and a secondary goal or you have a primary goal and then you have this secondary factor that you have to deal with is kind of an interesting twist uh, i wonder how it plays out over time like is the storm there for like the duration or does it move or i, I maybe i didn't follow that along but i think it's a neat element that really adds to it Yeah, the way that we were thinking about it is that you would know, you would be told what direction the storm is moving in. So example, from left to right, uh, or from top to bottom. Um, and so each time you send a, a set of instructions to the rover, it's going to move one down onto the grid or one across or, you know, in whatever direction you are told that it's going to move. Um, and so you just have to send uh, your set of commands and make sure that you're not in the oncoming path of the storm. Um, and that you're you're shielded from it um, so that the rover doesn't get covered in dust. Yeah, my I think just building on Matt's comment, I think my sense is that it's a very solid foundation for a puzzle game. I think it, it looks great. The interface seems very clear. Um, but my instinct is that you want just one more element to, to give the player a challenge to be efficient. For example, it might have to do with energy usage and wanting to be in a sunny spot to recharge better. Or it might be that in a certain area, the, the rock formation is blocking the radio signals. So that's, do you wanna stop here instead of there? Or maybe there's better places to drop off a cache where it might roll away or not. So that then you're deciding, well, I could do this and it's less moves, but maybe a little bit more risky, or this is less efficient, but is a more sure bet. That's when you start to having that you're have something that counterpoints your very solid kind of programming orientation puzzle with with, uh, with one, one more notch of decision making. And then I think it could be a very solid um, game. But can, considering that you put all this together in the context of everything happening this term, and uh, you know, I know you went, you go through a very uh, rigorous concepting design process with the client. It's very impressive that you got this far. So I'm not saying it's lacking that. I'm saying that it's a great, it's a great foundation, and and uh, thinking about what it would what it would make to notch it up one more level. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to say, I think um, it was a very nice presentation. I like the way you guys sort of broke it down and walked us through the game, sort of the, some of the decisions you made, both from an art uh, and design perspective. So that was very useful. Um, and it's nice having seen the project a little earlier, seeing, you know, uh, some of the subtle changes. I think the the change in perspective was really nice. It cer certainly makes it read a little um, better. So in and certainly contributes to the idea of like that it is this visual puzzle that you're sort of setting up these moves ahead of time. So I think that all that um, uh, works really well. I I think it seems like um, I I hear what Eric's saying about that. It maybe it needs something. You know, maybe there's some other element that can be added. But I, I can also imagine this is uh, if we're thinking like the context of the game, like where someone's going to encounter this game, 
how long, like how old the person playing it is. Um, uh, it has a, a decent amount of complexity to it now, like uh, already. So um, I was just curious if you guys had a chance to, I imagine this is aimed at kids, right? Um, have you got a chance to try it out with kids at all yet? Or I mean, I know, I know it's hard to find them um, unless they're in your house and then they never leave. Not hard at my house. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the closest that I've gotten is, uh, or that we've gotten is testing it with my 18 year old brother. So I don't know if that counts. Mm -hmm. Um, and he found it pretty challenging at the beginning, but was, but was able to pick it up fairly fast. He's also a programmer. Um, I will say that, um, some people who play tested, including uh, adults, uh, found it fairly challenging. I think it, I think it depends on, uh, how much people play these kinds of games. Um, before, but but yeah, getting a large scale play test with um, students in our target audience is definitely something that we would like to do. Yeah, because I can imagine with the with kids like, and especially if you're imagining that someone's going to play this game for four, like you know, especially if it was originally for an event, they're going to play it for a very short time. Like you may have a lot of what you need in there already, and it, it maybe maybe already have right right amount of difficulty. So. Yeah, actually, Greg, you're, I think you're 100% right. If you if this is just designed to be played kiosk style one time only, I think you may actually have the perfect amount of complexity. Uh, if it's meant to be played multiple times at home and you want to level it up and it's, you know, it's 30 minutes, an hour or two, then, then you would need more. But yeah, that's, I think yeah. you're totally right. About that. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that um, kids love a challenge and that they're really going to like this game for for that reason. It makes it more fun. Thank you. All right, let's uh, have a little more round of applause for for uh, piloting Red Rover. Uh, and so now we're going to move on to here and there. Thank you. All right, sharing. We'll share the screen. We're a team here and there. My name is Antonio Guimaris. Uh, I'm Sherry Liu. The goal of our project is to make a device that can be, bring more accessibility to blind viewers at museum, blind visitors at a museum. And understanding the blind experience is something that uh, is perhaps key. And a lot of museums in New York City and other places offer monthly tours to people who are blind or visually impaired. But when a blind person wants to come unannounced or come to explore something beyond those monthly tours, often there's not an audio description or touch tours, uh, certainly not ones you can see right there and then, you have to schedule in advance and so forth. And when you come out to see something outside those tours and there's no description, it is like you're looking at a dark screen. You, as a blind person coming to a museum, would have no way to look at what you're standing in front of at a museum. Some museums have audio tours and uh, they don't necessarily describe what's going on. Uh, they just talk about the history, they talk about the artist, and that's more like a blurred screen view for a blind person. And if there's an opportunity to have audio tours and descriptions of uh, an artifact uh, um, or a diorama, then you get uh, a picture that is clear, the picture really comes to life. All right. So uh, there's some limitations with or mobility inside a museum for a person who is blind. Obviously, uh, I myself am blind and we can't really go from place to place. Uh, by ourselves all that well, because if you're doing that, you're, being, you're gonna be touching the artwork sometimes in order to orient yourself and so forth. So we think that technology is, is really difficult for technology to solve that problem. It's not that easy for technology to do that. So we suggest that a blind person comes to a museum with or be met at the museum by a sighted person who can be a sighted guide to that person. All right. So we create an app that can use in two ways. The virtual tour, which you can use in anywhere, 
and the museum tour, which you only need to tap on the NFC tag on the diorama to listen the audio description when you are visiting the uh, the museum. The app has the voiceover and big touch button design, which is good for the blind person to use. Uh, when you open the app, Welcome to Here and There Audio Museum Tour. Uh, it has the Change Language button and Start Tool button on the main page. You can click on the Change Language button. Change Language. You choose the language you want. English. And set the language. Set language in English. And when you click on the Start Tour, Start Tour. It will ask you to do uh to uh which tour do you want. And if you are at home, you can choose the virtual tour. Virtual tour. And it will directly bring you to the hall list. You can select the hall. North American mammals. And select the diorama. Start to play the audio of Wolf. And it will bring you to the play uh, page. And the one six means uh, you are listening the first clip of the six audios. And here's the play. Wolf. Wolf Howl. In this diorama, we see two wolves chasing after something in the snow. Press next to continue or previous to go back. Click next for the Go next to one. next audio clip. And if you want to skip, just click next. Go to next audio clip. If you want to go back, just click the previous. Back to the previous page. Play the audio. Interrupt. Uh, Sherry, can you stop sharing and reshare your screen? I've, I've been told that there's. Step a... aside. This wolf pack is chasing I'm sorry, a deep. Can you stop sharing your screen and reshare it? I've been told that some people are having issues seeing it through Zoom. So uh, maybe if you stop sharing your screen and reshare it, then people will be able to, to see it. Okay. Thank you. Can anyone see that? Let's see. Logan, can you see that? So, okay. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. Logan? Welcome to Here and There Audio Museum Tour. Sorry, Is Logan okay? can't see it. Is everybody else seeing it but Logan? Only Logan's not seeing it? Hey, Logan, uh, why don't you exit and come right back? Sorry, it's important that Logan sees this because he's the one who's actually streaming it to YouTube. Okay. So uh, I apologize for the technical issues when doing virtual presentations, uh, but uh, I just want to make sure that the... Okay, good to go. Sorry about that, Sherry. Uh, please continue. Okay. Start tour. Virtual tour. North American mammals. Start to play the audio of Wolf. Go to next audio clip. So the second one will be. Step aside. This wolf pack is chasing a deer that's running for its life behind where you are standing. The bear may pursue the deer for several miles to exhaust it, then bring it down in a joint effort. Group hunting is how wolves can prey on animals much bigger than themselves. Still, deer are fast, and, and this one had a head to start. The page, the track back to the main page. The main page. And if you are in the museum, you just click Start Tour. Uh, museum Tour. In Museum. And it will directly bring you to the play audio page and you need to tap to the tag. You are standing in front of the wolf diorama at the Bernard Family Hall of North American Mammals. Listen to the clip. Go to next go to next audio clip. The wolf pack. A pack of wolves may have as few as two and as many as several dozen wolves. The leaders are usually a mating pair. 
the alpha male and female, followed mainly by their offspring. The alpha pair dominates the family. The alpha female will snap and snarl at lesser females to prevent them from... Uh, so... Uh, we need to use the NFC to detect the audio play device. So NFC is sent to near field communication. It needs the device to very close to the tag about an inch away. Uh, in order to make the blind person find where the tag is, we want to place the tag on each side of the corner, like what the uh, picture shows. Uh, the blue circle is the NFC tag. It is easy to find when they find where the corner is. All right. All right. The first prototype we came up with uh, was Arduino based and Arduino is simply a microcontroller, mini computer that can be attached to other devices. We looked to provide more audio descriptions at museums and the device can play the description from uh, scanning the tag and playing the audio file via its MP3 chip and the NFC chip attached to it. All right, so the prototype at work is a video uh, here showing the actual prototype playing the audio. Wolf, wolf howl. Step aside, this wolf pack is chasing a deer that's running for its life behind where you are standing. Did you know all dogs evolved from wolves, the result of multiple domestication events that took place at least 15,000 years ago? There, all right. So there are some limitations with this prototype. Uh, one of them is that you can only have one tag per sound clip, as opposed to a future app version that would have uh, one tag playing of various uh, sounds. The current device that we started with, the Arduino Uno, has a small amount of memory, so running the code for a lot of tags is not possible with that. We're prototyping with something else, another Arduino, but the app version would solve that. Uh, as you saw before, as described, uh, it's hard to locate the tags, so hopefully placing one in each corner of the diorama solves that problem. And when we started thinking about this, we wanted to test out QR codes as, as well, but QR codes are harder for a camera to be, uh, they are harder to be found by the blind person scanning around with the camera of a phone. So we stuck with uh, the NFC tags instead, all right? So uh, we hope the app we build can be used in this or any other museum to help more blind person to have a museum tour opportunity and bring more uh, accessibility to the museum space. And we would like to thank the NYC Natural History Museum for their mentorship. We also wanna thank our clients, collaborators, classmates and others, Deborah Everett Lane, Yosin Che, Rafael Pellegrino, Matt Tarr, Lauren Drake, Brian Fu, Pierce Leiden, Blair Moskowitz, Brent Bailey, Elizabeth P. Ballou, Greg Treffy, Matt Parker, and all our classmates. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, team here and there. Uh, and so uh, if any of the clients want to start with questions, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is really neat and really exciting stuff, you guys. Um, you should be proud. Um, the EFC reader prototype that you made is really neat. I'm wondering, are there like mass produced readers that exist? So um, one option going into the future would be to design hardware that's basically your own printed 
like computer chips, your printed circuit boards, they're called. And uh, they would be probably the most uh, logical way to go. There are some readers in the market that, that are used by companies like uh, uh, audio tour, uh, you know, companies out, uh, out there. But we, we started with a prototype and we want to move to a phone based solution so that the phone itself has an NFC reader on it. Most Droid and iPhone devices now. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for my fellow classmates. Matt, is that okay? Please. Okay. Uh, Antonio, we talked a little bit about uh, accessibility for game designers themselves and not just their players at the beginning of the semester and how that was kind of frustrating because Unity doesn't really seem to have very many tools um, to, to make Unity itself accessible and kind of the same seems to be true for a lot of game engines. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, if there if there are any methods of uh, design and development um, that are accessible to designers themselves that you discovered over the course of the semester? Well, one part of it is uh, sticking with audio design uh, and editing audio and composing for, for that um, and working with others, working in collaboration with other people to produce the videos and the slides and everything that we may had to do throughout the semester was was key. So there's not you never work by yourself. So that's also important to know. Um, hey there. So um, I was. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Greg. Oh, I was going to say, I, great presentation. I, I love the a couple things. I love the sort of the you giving the context at the beginning that sort of set up the problem space, um, and then uh, and then sort of a, a walkthrough. I think the the walkthrough you guys made for it was excellent. It did a really good job of sort of showing what this you know illustrating what this experience might be like, and then also just um, having seen also seen the project a couple like a month or so ago. It's it's cool to see how far it's come. Like the the audio was fantastic. Every time you turn the clip off, I'm like, no, I want to hear more. Um, and so I thought that was, it was just, uh, it was very compelling. And, um, and, and, I, and I love the way you thought through the problem sort of end to end, both from like a, um, a content perspective, but also from this sort of technical accessibility -ish, um, way as well. So awesome, well done. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with the other comments too. Uh, I, I mean, I, honestly, I think that with, with that degree of polish on the audio, I think this could be an app that's targeted at any museum goer, not necessarily just for, um, you know, visually um, challenged people. I also think that, um, but I, I would love to hear uh, Antonio and Sherry, you two talk a little bit about the context of the museum. How, what do you feel the being in that physical space brings to the experience, right? Because the danger of something like this is that the audio gets so good and the app itself gets so good. And then you wonder, well, why do I even need to go to the museum, right? So do you, do you feel that there are, uh, do you feel that is a, that is a concern? And, and I'm just curious to hear your thinking about that, what, what, the, what the context brings or what, what being in a space brings to the experience, either with what you're proposing or with other features that you might add. Sure, do you want to start? Uh, so I have been to that museum once, and I feel like uh, it is a very interesting museum that has so many uh, animals diorama. And but uh, honestly, I feel like it's not that lively like uh, when we see that in the zoo. So uh, we just get the idea like uh, to make that sounds lively for the blind person yeah they uh, they can also feel like what environment they're in and they can know uh, about some knowledge about the animals yeah i agree with that and i would add that you know it, it would be up to a museum whether they want access from home and anywhere or just at their location because you have the 
near field communication and FC tag right. at the at the location. So it, it would be up to a, a a museum to decide oh we don't want access from home or we do want access from home but want the stats from that and but I guess I'm just curious, I guess if as you're navigating the space, there is some kind of curatorial spatial navigation that happens, right? I think that becomes another layer on the experience, like the actual layout of the museum becomes part of the, the way that you come to know the content, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would say something like this would definitely bring a place uh, alive. Mm. Right now, going through the African mammals, uh, hall was like standing in front of anything and anywhere like unless there's a sighted person there telling you that this is a such and such an animal a blind person could be standing in front of just I don't know a pole and and, and it's it's right. no no fault of the museum right. but when something like this is is in, incorporated you do become more familiar with what's there and it, that whole becoming alive thing changes the place mm. And it's and it's a private thing because you, you you your phone you can have a, a headphone jack so you plug in headphones and you have that experience you don't bother the next person next to you and, and, and that's excellent and the only other thing that I that came to mind was maybe at the very end there might be some excellent I don't know po like period poems right nineteenth century poems about that animal or something that that you could be read at the end, but it's a really, it's really interesting to think about how you're mixing documentary sounds with scientific knowledge, with more na almost narrative of, of what's going on in the, um, in the exhibit. So yeah, really interesting to, to, to share your thinking with us. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think following on sort of what you, Eric, you were saying, I think that what there, there's something about to the way you guys have thought about the sort of the range of activity, like the sort of the the sort of the depth of the experience like how someone has to they, they you chose to do nfc versus something else where like it's already you're kind of putting it in this place where you're like okay here you're gonna touch things so i can see this being derek's point about like why in the museum like places where there's like objects you can touch i can see this being even more like that's that begins to sort of deliver on that thing like because there was a moment where i i felt the same way i was like oh maybe i could just listen to this at home um but if once you i could see this in that nfc technology and the way you guys thought about it being more and more integrated with objects which probably maybe answered to some degree eric's uh your your question um hi this it hi antonio it's it's deborah um, so, and building on what Eric and Greg just said, I, uh, the more that you also think about, you know, adding in those other layers beyond the visual description and the sort of like the educational content, the, the poem, the soundscape, the direct integration with anything that's touchable, the more I think that that also then makes it appealing to, you know, a wider audience as well, that it then becomes something that, uh, it is not just sort of like, uh, it, it is not only a supplement for visually impaired people, but for is engaging for all audiences and really sort of like adds a level of immersiveness and sort of deeper engagement with the, with the experience on site. So I think those are all great things to think about. I just wanted to say um, beautiful presentation and now more than ever, we're thinking about virtual tours and it's even more important that we have options for people who can't come to the physical space to be able to experience the museum. Um, and this is a whole new level having this kind of rich audio option for virtual museum visitors is really inspiring because um, we've been thinking about it as a more of a visual presentation um, for online visitors. So this is really interesting and um, gives us a lot to think about. So I want to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Ajin, do you have a uh, one last comment before we move on to the next screen? Sure. I, I just wanted to say thank you again for showing that working prototype. I see hard work there to make that function <laughs> that way. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's smart to choose the NFC over other technologies using proximity. So there are other, I know there are other options you could have gone, but I think this is very smart because I mean, you can use your phone as a, 
NFC reader. And so I see this experience will be very seamless for actual visitors. So great job on that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much team here and there. One last round of applause. Now we are going to move on to food journey. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. I'm Chong. Uh, this is Samina and this is Elena. Together, we are the food journey team from NYU's Dining for the Museum class. Uh, I will introduce you to our project and how we made it. So the first question is, what is the food journey? Uh, yeah. So why do we see our opportunities here? First, uh, the museum has already got the Explore app that guide people to their destination. Waiters are already uh, used to using it within a huge museum. Well, on the other hand, people uh, still feel difficulties in deciding which hall to give their highest priority. Uh, we notice that many of our viewers just want to know a little bit about everything. One way that's often given by an experience guide is the theme journey. Uh, when doing this, people explore different hosts and um, because the journey is, uh, is topic oriented, it will be easier to learn and remember things. Uh, so what we do is by uh, visualizing and animating this kind of journey, uh, we can give this experience to millions of visitors uh, at their own pace. So finally, uh, we choose food as our example uh, because it's a universal pill and it will be easier for everyone to connect. Uh, it will be easy to connect with us from different cultures and backgrounds. Okay, uh, Samina so will now talk you through our prototype, please. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the um, entrance to the experience. We were thinking of having this be an augmentation of a regular visitor experience when entering said museum. Um, I will be playing a prototype very quickly and walking you through. So um, again, you're just walking through the experience and this is um, utilizing the Explorer app currently. So there's already capabilities within, within the app to track your location. And in this example, oops, sorry. And let me restart that. In this example, um, you would essentially be looking at the, um, you either get a push notification on your phone or already be looking in the application to see your location in relative space to all the other um, exhibits. Uh, there would be an example of a food moment icon. Dang it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so you'd see the food moment icon. Get in there. And so it would open up your experience to the food journey, essentially. Um, it'd have this quick little piece about what exactly this is, the, um, like Jay said, the rich interactions of the different cultures and you know, the food traditions. You'd get um, a little prompt as to how to start this journey and where you'd be collecting your food cards, which essentially would be recipes you collect at the end of these modules, which we'll explain later. Um, once you click on that food moment, you'd see a list of all of the um, possible food moments in the museum and an option to take you there. So it'll give you a directed footpath as to how to access this um, piece. So in this example, this would be in the Hall of Pacific Peoples. Um, and so this is kind of like an augmentation of the artifacts that are already currently on display. So in this example, um, this is an example of a wooden sculpture that is found inside of one of the display cases, um, specifically in the Micronesia, as we saw in the title. So um, the visitor would be able to play a little guessing game to help try to contextualize what exactly these artifacts are and how they pertain to the culture, the food. And on um, a correct guess, they would be able to, um, you saw a little pop up here about the um, a recipe being added to their um, little book, their li little library here of recipes. So um, here they'd get a little blip about uh, as, like little bite-sized information about uh, what exactly this artifact is. Again, how um, 
just to contextualize a little bit. And then they'd had an option once clicking on that um, icon to actually open up and see what this is um, and then get a recipe actually as to what um, food item could be made using this artifact or what it would historically be used for. Um, and so another example of this would be maybe if not a matching game, there's also um, capabilities for an interactive mini game. So um, this is an example of a, another type of uh, module essentially where um, the user would actually be doing an interactive experience. We wanted to focus on um, again, accessibility. Um, so all of the mini games and experiences could be played using one finger. So um, here's a very quick example of what this uh, five part module would look like. Each screen um, they would be interacting with. So there'd be a swipe arrow to interact. Um, you'd actually have a little animation as to how to move the um, incomplete said step of this process. They'd have a small um, piece right here about what exactly this process is. In this said example, um, this is for the hottest honey corn cake making. So um, this is the very first step of, you know, the corn is whole, dried, and pounded, and so it's basically making the flour um, of this piece. In the second uh, step, they'd be actually washing the corn uh, flour to make a dough ball, essentially, and so you'd see that progress visualized there. And then uh, here, this is again using the pieces that are already in the museum, so there is a um, hand drill, so a fire starter. Again, it would be, uh, you know, visualizing this and how exactly it would be used. And then um, this is an example of actually boiling the corn cake. And as it finishes cooking, it rises to the top and uh, floats where the visitor can tap that and you know, finish that experience. Um, at the end of this, where they completed all of these, they get a little um, expanded piece of information about you know, what exactly goes into this. So in this example, it'd be um, talking about the corn, how it's a unique uh, heirloom variety of corn that is very important to that culture. And um, again, like elaborating the cooking process to try to um, contextualize a little bit more. And then they'd be able to tap on this little icon and turn the card for the recipe. And then this is a modern interpretation of what um, is actually made in this culture today. And so we wanted to be really um, mindful about, you know, having these recipes be something that is already produced by said culture and that they are willing to share with the world. So this is more of a modern interpretation. Like I was saying before, the um, corn, the specific heirloom of corn flour is very important to that culture. So instead, this is um, a modification of that where it's a lot more accessible so that, or someone can make it in their own home, in their own kitchen and have that piece of the muse museum taken home with them. Um, that essentially, uh, concludes this prototype right here, demonstration. And then I'll move on to the next screen about our design process and how we essentially arrived at this. So um, initially this idea was gonna be, uh, we were kind of thinking of it in an AR sort of um, experience where instead of it being ex like on the phone and um, it'd still be an extension of the Explorer app. However, it'd be a little more gamified in the sense of like you get, um, you know, it's more like a, there's a fail condition whereas we kind of moved to it being a little more accessible, where it's like it's more of the process and less of the end result and like how many stars you get. It would still be the element of uh, contextualization and what exactly, you know, how it's how this uh, recipe is enjoyed today. And then also the um, collection process of getting, you know, badges or um, your card collection. But we ended up um, settling on the recipe aspect of it to have that be something that tracks your progress throughout the app. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Alina to move over to the design process and how we found these types of uh, interactive pieces. Great. Um, thanks, Amina. So um, obviously we had to change a lot along the way. Um, we got real really fast. The museum and the rest of life as we know it uh, went remote one week after our pitch was selected and our team was formed. So there was the obvious technical limitation of AR and the impossibility of doing user testing. Um, however, that didn't stop us. Um, so we just uh, reformatted the, um, the experiences and the, and the games that people would play with food items um, on a format that wouldn't disrupt or depend on being in the museum, but still enhance and expand, extend the museum experience. Um, so how we chose what we were representing was a mixture of uh, chance and research. Um, we had the uh, very good chance to meet a museum educator in the Eastern Woodlands uh, Hall 
in the last uh, on-site uh, visit that we had who took us through a step-by-step -step process of corn cake making. We also wanted to uh, acknowledge that we are working and living on uh, the unceded territory of the Lenape, Lenape people. And so that was an extra reason to uh, select um, that step-by-step um, -step food game. The uh, Micronesian coconut scraping stool was uh, an evocative item that um, that was well, really well suited to a guessing game, which is something that is already existing in the, um, in the museum's uh, Explorer app. And it's also connected to personal background in our team who had been seeing this in use uh, since childhood. Uh, we referenced 12 displays in the museum's cultural halls with food items, so that could be extended. And there's also uh, noted 9,843 food items in the museum's online uh, database. So this could go uh, much further. Um, into the uh, visual design. We initially went for um, white silhouettes that could be integrated really nicely to, um, to realistic photography and uh, as well as contextualizing uh, the size references. Uh, the stylized cutouts would be for easier animation of different items. Of course, we needed to adapt this to uh, the museum's current style guide. Um, so that so that slightly evolved. Uh, the museum uh, if visitors should feel that they are in um, in an experience that they are already familiar with, and so we designed an icon that would fit within the existing museum interest icons. Um, slightly stand out to give the sense of interactivity, but fit within the styles. We were uh, very lucky to get a style guide from our uh, client team and uh, adapt fonts and uh, general uh, design treatment to fit what was currently going on in the app. Um, we also changed our uh, uh, visitor progression mechanic. This was an important design challenge was uh, for visitors to know what they had achieved as well as know what was ahead of them in all the rich uh, elements the museum has to offer. We did find that uh, getting a badge reward on your phone was a little bit disconnected from the cultural experience and had to be taught. And so we decided to lean on something that people have been doing forever. Before digital media, people have been collecting postcards to remember their experiences. They have been collecting recipes to share with each other and they have been collecting card sets, which is an easy way to keep track of a lot of different units. Um, and so that's how we landed on our final um, visitor progression. Um, so um, highlights of our journey, um, the food journey would present uh, many food moments uh, that would be a set of interactive cards that would um, extend your knowledge of the museum and make, make playful things that are otherwise uh, inanimate at the museum, as well as provide a themed red thread throughout all the cultures and all the possibilities that, um, that we can learn about um, our heritage. And that pretty much wraps it up. I'll hand you back to Samina to discuss our possible futures. Unmute, there we go. So as far as the um, possible future um, developments that this project could take on, um, we were thinking uh, definitely all of our uh, you know, modules that we chose and all of the content we chose definitely needs validation from the anthropology department just to make sure that we again are very mindful of, you know, depicting these cultures correctly and in a way that, you know, is in dialogue with said members of that culture to make sure that we're mindful of all of that. Um, this is also a great opportunity for off, like an offsite addition to the museum's online presence. Um, I know when we were doing our research for this, uh, we actually were able to access the Explorer app um, remotely and actually go and play through the modules that were already currently there. And that was invaluable to our um, design process. And I feel like that that would be, this is a very interesting example of how to take a piece of the museum home. And you know, um, this could either be in the Explorer app, this could even be um, a possibility for uh, a different type of online presence. So some other type of virtual learning that um, is facilitated through the museum via website or social media, anything along those lines. 
Um, another thing that is very important that we actually, uh, we definitely need more user testing. Um, we'd like to be able to continue iterating on this and polishing it and making sure that this type of user experience and this flow is, um, you know, palatable to the um, visitor and that, you know, they are really are getting what's important, which is those little pieces of information that they, you know, can internalize and take home with them and enjoy in their own time. Um, I want to say a special thank you to um, the, the museum and their consulting team that helped us out so much. I want to say thank you to Deborah, to Matt, Raphael, Brett, Blair, Karen, Ocean, Pete, Pierce, and um, thank you to our professors um, and instructors. So Matt and Greg, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our fellow classmates for providing great feedback and um, furthering our design process. Thank you so much. And moving over to Q&A. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that. Uh, who wants to start the questions? Uh, I can start. <laughs> okay, uh, so that was a great presentation. It really looks fabulous and it looks fun. And uh, I, I think that um, I, I had a question. I may I may have missed it as you're going through the presentation. Do you have do you have a screen that shows you what sort of like the the full dashboard looks like when you first launch it? Yeah, um, I can go back to the prototype very quickly. And I, I do apologize. The um, the prototype does move very quickly. Um, I will get that right there for you. Yeah, so this is kind of the full dashboard. Um, so it'd be this piece where you could scroll this uh, or scroll up to start. So swipe up and yep. you would see um, all of the tiles that you could play or the ones that in this example are currently finished already and right. accessible to your deck. So, so the only thing that I was going to, um, one thing that I was going to mention about that was, you know, the way that, for example, if you've ever used the New York Times cooking app, you know, there's like a recipe box, right? Your recipe cards and like your final bits that your final cards of information, your postcards are all great. You may want to think about having a button where you can just access those directly so that after you've done a certain number of exhibits, if you just want to quickly get to the recipe, like I don't know whether you were thinking that the recipe would be mailed to you, but if you just had like a little icon, then you could access all of the recipes very easily that you've collected. So um, actually, we, actually at the I'm top sorry. of the screen, yeah, we, we do have, have a button. Oh, okay. But, it, but that's <laughs> a design challenge. Yeah. cleaned over that in the presentation. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so then I think as we, as I, uh, as I or somebody else had mentioned uh, in one of the client meetings, like I think this works really well for food. And I think that there, you know, if you are thinking about, you know, if this could be expanded in the future, right? Um, there are other categories that would work really nicely with this also, like music, for example. There are a lot of examples of musical instruments um, throughout the cultural halls. Uh, and what I think is so uh, effective about something like this, um, and, and here I would actually talk about it a little bit in conjunction with here and there, is that it adds a level of immersiveness to the experience so that you're not just like a lot of, um, uh, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of our permanent halls have a very sort of like uh, passive format, right? You walk through, you look, and you read, right? That's sort of like the most of the permanent halls are like that. And so being able to add these layers of immersiveness and interactivity are really nice, um, certainly for inside the museum. But then as you know, as you mentioned, and as we discussed with here and there, also for thinking about in this moment that we're in, you know, what do we think, you know, how do we think about creating sort of like that virtual, that remote experience for visitors, um, which is going to go on longer than, you know, once the museum opens, because there may take a while for, uh, you know, we'll have reduced capacity, people may not feel comfortable going to the museum. Um, and a lot of the current website experience about the permanent halls, again, is sort of like images and description, right? Uh, and so for thinking about how can we create this sense of immersiveness and interactivity for the permanent hall experience on the web as well as on site. Uh, and so uh, so so I, I think it's I, I think it's something that definitely would work well on site and also remotely um, as a way to keep people engaged. So good work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to chime in and say, you know, I think I, I watched you guys change and adapt to this and I, you know, and I think um, 
all of them, all of you guys have, but this one particularly, I just know uh, that you really, you know, you listened to us and, and, and tweaked and changed. I think it's, I think it is um, a really neat, uh, like there are many, many themes you could do, but food obviously is one that is so interesting and, and lends itself to going home and trying, you know, uh, especially right now. But um, so I think, yeah, food, music, games, like uh, weapons, you know, like, uh, sure, why not? Let's make atlatls, you know? Um, but, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff I think that really, you know, moves across the museum, like all of the cultural halls. Um, although, of course, you do have that hurdle of, uh, which you guys have done a great job, I mean, from my perspective, of being sensitive to the fact that uh, we particularly have to be careful about how we address the cultural halls. Um, so, yeah, I think that, uh, and we've talked about this, I think, but, um, you know, there's pieces of this that I think are absolutely ready for prime time. And then there's other pieces that I would definitely want to see tested as we, as we've talked about, like the linearity of it and whether or not people need to do all of the recipe things for any reason, or whether one is enough or two is enough, or, you know, happenstance is a lot of what the Explorer is and serendipity is what the app is built around. Um, so anyways, I look forward to sort of the, the next, next round, but I do think that, um, like literally just, and I, and I haven't had a chance to talk deeply with the social media team yet, except to invite them to this a couple of weeks ago, which I, I don't think I reminded them to, I apologize, but, um, but yeah, I feel like the, the, a, a, a Snapchat or Instagram story where we just sort of like borrow from some of these concepts and say like, look, you guys can, you can try this at home. Here's an app, you know, we do these objects of the day all the time. So, um. Anyway, it's a yeah, really fantastic exploration about what we could do and, and how we could further mine the physical uh, objects of the museum. So thanks. Thank you for your feedback, much appreciated. Yeah, I think there you guys are. did an amazing job um, with cultural content, which is really challenging. And um, you brought the values that we bring to cultural education, which is that these cultures are persistent, that they, these people, are alive today and they, they have um, connections to objects and you brought these inanimate objects to life um, through the way that people actually use them. Um, so I think it's just fantastic and a real value add. And um, yeah, it's really exciting to see um, how well you guys kind of mapped to how we think about cultural and cultural education. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, something I just wanted to add, which I think I've said probably every week, but every week I've always been impressed by your visuals. Um, so I know in the beginning you were working through, you know, sketching it out and trying to figure out what it would look like. And sometimes towards the beginning, it didn't quite look like it would fit into Explorer, but you were working on ideas. So that was perfectly fine. But every week it got closer and closer to where I think it's at the point of, we couldn't entirely just drop it in it's so close to imagine what that this is real for us that um, I just really want to commend you on on what you've done visually and even making the logos and just making it fit so well that we're like well yeah this looks like it makes sense and that can really count for a lot in one of these presentations so um, well done on on everything and the visuals thank you yeah, adding to the point, I want to mention really nice uh, interaction design also. And also it's very clear how I can enter this uh, module in the app, in the context of the app and how to start and how to end is super clear. It's a great job on that, like designing user flow. And yes, of course, like great graphics design and I love the graphics and I can imagine this is already part of the app because it fits so well. And one thing I wanted to mention is, one thing I really liked about uh, your earlier prototype is like you have this map view and like highlighting the points uh, in the hall. Like, so you see like where you are located in the hall and where these modules are located. So I kind of missed that part because that was really great part that you can actually see this whole thing as one package and then you're motivated to go to a next point and then explore more content. So. And it gives some kind of like motivation and as well as like continuity in the experience. I kind of miss that map, yeah, that view. So I, I think, yeah, for on-site experience, they'll be very helpful. Yeah, exactly, yeah, that one. Oh, you had it, okay, great, sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. and also I think it, this is gonna work really well as a web uh, experience also. So, I mean, like Karen said, we are imagining 
to uh, build some virtual like exhibit experience. So like if you have three different holes, literally three different websites, we can have this module embedded in like each, each hole and it's gonna work really great. And uh, it's kind of introducing, you guys are kind of introducing like new curated way of navigating through the same space, but with this keyword and category. So I really like that aspect of this design. Thank you so much. Thank you for your feedback. Um, Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in with a few quick comments. Those are, I think I agree with everything that's been said. The visual language is, is strong and sophisticated. And I just want to point out that the team um, has branded their backgrounds for the presentation. So they're definitely thinking visually. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> um, I, also, the it's very tricky to design an experience into an existing app. And I think that 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 that's that's quite impressive too, and the idea that you're earning the recipes as the result of the experience is nice because it not only on an experience design level connects the the digital experience with the real world as the sort of the coda to the experience. You do something in the real world, but I think also as it as was pointed out that that also connects to the values. The idea that like this isn't just in a museum, this is a living culture. So that's quite strong. I think the place where you could think about it more is not the middle and the end, but maybe the beginning. I would love, I think that maybe there could be some sense of discovery or, or uh, spontaneity to the beginning, a sort of serendipity, like how do you stumble upon something like this? Right now, I guess, in the, at least in the in-museum experience, it becomes like a scavenger hunt check mark. I go here, I go there. I don't know if there's something to do with proximity or uh, you're kind of smelling the food from a distance or you're you're picking a certain kind of flavor, like spicy food or sweet food or, you know what I mean? So that, so that it's getting to know you a little bit and then it's giving you kind of threads to follow based on that. So I think there could be a little bit more of that sense of um, uh, like drawing you into the experience, but overall it's quite strong. Really good work. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric, definitely noted. I think this was one of the moments where um, we really, um, we had a few, we would mapped out a few of those options, but we would uh, have needed user testing to confirm that yeah. because we couldn't, it uh, both like user testing amongst ourselves, but, um, and, and other people at the museum, but, uh, but also closer user testing with a larger, um, uh, a larger representatives of the anthropology team um, to make sure that it, it did it justice um, and that we weren't going on our own projections. Right. Right. Because of course that's a, a designer's fallacy. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. What I really love is that you use in your process. You talked about starting with something much more conventional, gamified badges, and you you strip that away. And I think that's a great that's a great kind of design process where you maybe start with a more complicated, more vanilla expected thing, and then once you once you get rid of some of those elements, you kind of see what's left, and often it's more original uh, and sophisticated. Great Thank job. Uh, one more round of applause for a food journey. And now we're going to move on to our uh, final presentation of the day. Uh, Snap Odyssey Micro Expedition. All right. Uh, let me share my screen. All right. Uh, does everyone see it now? All Actually, right. we're going to wait for a second to make sure that Logan, uh, there's been some issues with Logan uh, being able to stream it. So Logan, can you confirm that you are OK with this? Or do you need to? Oh, he says we're good to go. OK, go ahead. OK, so yeah. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm Adlan, and this is my project. It's called Snap Odyssey Micro Expeditions. It's a virtual reality nature photography experience. So uh, let me just show you uh, how it goes. So yeah, this is the uh, initial experience. So uh, you have this camera, like a virtual camera that you can uh, use as a virtual reality nature photographer. And then you can take pictures of animals around you and you can learn more about them. So uh, in this experience, so for this uh, footage of the video, uh, you are in the uh, spider webs. You see there are some ants there uh, on the left side, and then you also see uh, like the spiders like on, top of, on top of that, and then you can take pictures and just learn more uh, about them based on the facts. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of uh, 
highly inspired from uh, photography based games in general, like a uh, Pokemon Snap and um, like Fatal Frame. And then it kind of uh, reminds me of, hey, why, why don't we just try this on VR? And then let's see how uh, this works uh, for uh, museums, because I think it could uh, provide a lot of both uh, educational and also fun. So uh, that's why this project uh, comes to mind. So yeah, maybe I can uh, skip some of the parts so you can see. It's like, uh, because uh, this experience is actually uh, semi-procedural. So every time you play uh, this experience, there will be shown uh, different types of worlds and insects. So yeah, I see that one there, so grasshopper. And then, yeah, let me just uh, skip it for this. It's the butterflies. Um, yeah, there's the last section, there's the wasps. So yeah, you can take a really close look at the wasp and then, all right, that's the, that's the whole experience. Oh, thanks for playing. And then, um, so yeah, uh, the prologue of this experience is that you are tasked to take pictures of the animals in the safari, but then like the professor's cat like messed up with their, a shrinking ray and then you got shrunk down into a microscopic size and then so you have to explore the whole world uh, the ins insect world to see how insects like scale up to their size and then see how insects can produce sound see how they can produce uh, different kinds of defense mechanisms and then you can also see like very crazy physiology and it just really looks very out of world and then you can see how insects uh, camouflage between their uh, environments and then we can see how insects can be pollinators be very useful for a uh, human culture and then you can see how they predate each other and how they reproduce or maybe something else really completely different that you've never seen before so that's why i think uh, it's very uh, it's very great to have like an experience on insects for this. So this was the previous exhibition round down that I planned. So uh, in the waiting line, you can see how to play. And then you also see a lot of uh, people who are, are playing the game. So it's going to be three to five minutes experience. And as I explained earlier, so this is a uh, semi-procedural. So every time you play this game, uh, it will have different insects and then uh, it has a lot of, uh, so you can play it again and then you will see uh, different types of insects. And then, yeah, it was also uh, previously uh, designed to be a local multiplayer, meaning that uh, like four players can uh, see each other and then uh, collaborate like, hey, uh, let's take a picture from that angle and let's see if you can take a picture from the other angle. So uh, this is the uh, list of insects that I've uh, previously planned. So I, uh, since I'm working alone and then I don't have much time to develop, uh, to uh, make all the 3D models, I decided to browse on uh, Google Poly and uh, Sketchfab for uh, free royalty uh, 3D models. And these are all uh, the models that I found. And then, yeah, I come up uh, with the decision that I was going to make a very uh, realistic high definition models, but then uh, after we talked, uh, after we talked around the technical limitations of the Oculus Quest, and then we just decided to pick uh, a cute low poly 3D models of insects, and then we also just decided to pick the ones that are uh, that are usually common and also included in the museum. So yeah, these are the five uh, semi-procedural worlds. There are five different worlds and then three out of five will be uh, shown in the experience. So yeah, back in the demo, I, will, I show uh, all of them just to see how it looks like if it's in VR. But in the one experience, there's going to be three out of five. So there's the flowers area. You can see the 
butterflies and ladybugs and then grounds area you see the cockroaches and like centipede spider webs you see how there's um, army of ants and there are two spiders on top of that and then uh, there's the bee gardens you see bees and also there's like a wasp hiding there and the last one is the grasslands where you see a pill bug and then uh, the grasshoppers and butterflies. So yeah, I also uh, found out how to implement uh, player avatars. So this was previously uh, designed as a multiplayer, a local multiplayer game. So uh, everyone needs like a avatar to represent themselves. So I'll just make a very basic avatar with different hats so everyone can see, uh, everyone can refer to each other and then just like, oh yeah, you're, you're the one with the pirate hat, you're the one with the witch hat. So yeah, I think it's really interesting. And this is the uh, development uh, section with the Unity. So all that I did was I refactored all the um, message code previously. And then I optimized the new environment because this was previously made with, uh, this was previously just a personal project. And then I kind of uh, adapted it into a uh, museum setting with more features. And I also redesigned the uh, interaction design for uh, the overall experience. So uh, as well as uh, the tutorial system or the onboarding experience and like shuffling different uh, worlds. So yeah, due to the uh, condition, I didn't really uh, implement all the features, but uh, it went really well. So this is how I decided the interaction design for the snap info mechanic. There are three possibilities. And then uh, the first one was just a take a picture and then there's going to be an anchored uh, information at the bottom of the uh, 3D model. And then that just pops up uh, right over there. And then the second one is the, uh, the second one is the one that I decided to pick later. So it just pops up right next to the camera. And then the third one uh, doesn't, it shows the camera, uh, it shows the information anchored to the 3D model at the bottom of the 3D model and then just pops up. And then when you take a picture and then you can put like a small slot in the dashboard where you can learn more about the insects and it'll just show like a little small hologram. But yeah, that's kind of taking a lot of development time for that. So I've decided to pick uh, the second one, which we see in the demo. Um, I think it's going really well. And so for interaction design for the onboarding experience. Uh, yes, sir. So yeah, uh, for the interaction design, uh, the audio visual instructions, because yeah, there are some uh, technical uh, issues with me screen recording the uh, virtual reality experience. And then uh, I couldn't really uh, record the sound. So uh, that's why uh, there's no sound in the demo. But if you play like the whole experience, you will see um, letter, there's like a narrator. Oh wait, is there like a chat or something? Oh wait. Oh, what? oops, I did something. Oh, oh wait. All right. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Just too many tabs opening. Uh, all right. The, uh, Sorry about that. Do you see it now? <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, back to the uh, topic. So uh, there's like audiovisual instructions because there's no uh, standard for VR experiences yet for uh, design experiences. I decided just to make like a huge uh, template, uh, not a template, uh, like a scheme of the controls just on the, on the top of the screen of the sky and then you just see, oh, th this is the button for grabbing the camera. And then this is the button for, while holding, then just take a snapshot of the camera. And then uh, there's also the help panel on the dashboard. So in case if anyone forgets how uh, the controls are, 
they can just look at the dashboard. So I think that's like, getting a lot of uh, for like ease of accessibility. And then, yeah, these are the current constraints for the uh, development of the uh, game because I only have one Oculus Quest and I couldn't really show it to anyone because it's very uh, different, but a good thing. Uh, uh, Brett has the uh, Oculus Quest, so I can actually uh, test uh, how it looks like uh, when uh, being played by uh, other players. And so I decided to focus on single player because uh, the pandemic, and then I that made me also uh, unable to test the local multiplayer features. Um, yeah, also have them at the time, but yeah, uh, but I still interested in developing this uh, in the future because uh, there are previously uh, features that I couldn't work on, especially the email feature. I think this is a very interesting one because you can take pictures uh, from the virtual experience and then send it to your email and then you can actually share it on your like social media. So I think it's a really interesting like an um, experience uh, experience based uh, user generated pictures and then there will be photo tasks so in the experience there will be tasks and then you will be rewarded for like real life uh, museum souvenirs I think that's really interesting and then the evaluation algorithm so uh, it will use a lot of computer vision algorithms just to uh, evaluate if the if the uh, pictures that you've taken have a uh, certain like artistic elements, for example, if it's like centered or close to the middle. And then, yeah, with like uh, audio objects, like spatial audio. So if you're really close to a certain insect, it will make a sound. So there will be um, enhanced uh, feel of a uh, physical presence when the animal is near you. And yeah, also do more user testing when the pandemic ends. Uh, and also this is like another uh, idea that I have for a potential app for the uh, museum on the Oculus store. So I think it's a great build up for the uh, insect center while being under construction and also being a uh, quarantine like this. So anyone uh, with a headset can still uh, play this content and then try to uh, have some fun and share it with uh, your friends. And also, uh, this will be very reuse, reusable for different parts of the museums and future events. So, yeah, at the so I'm just currently showing just the demo, but I've also been working on the pipeline for this. So, I think for anyone with a basic Unity uh, experience can just simply uh, remake all the ex uh, environments and then just uh, put it into like small objects. So, yet I've already considered that because. Uh, it will be like streamlined tools for future content development from for the museum. So that's what I've, I've been considering. So yeah, and um, yeah, thanks to uh, Brett Peterson for the I main client of the project. And then thanks to the Everett Lane for uh, providing me the uh, insect facts and uh, more information about the uh, insect section of the uh, museum. And yeah, thanks to Ahmed Parker for instructing the whole class. And thanks for um, all of you, uh, my classmates uh, for the course, for giving me uh, useful uh, feedback. So yeah, that's all for my presentation. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, so questions from the clients or from the class or from our guests? Um, yeah, I'll go. Uh, it was really fun working with yeah, Adeline on this. Um, I, I, I think the, the thing that most stuck out to me in your development process is how you were able to kind of streamline the user experience. I think that was great. Um, you know, I, I, the first playthrough, luckily I did have a, a headset in the first playthrough. I was like trying to like press buttons to get the car to go and stuff. And, and I think you did a really nice job of like of really streamlining that stripping it down to like the core of like this is the game this is the game is what i'm doing is is taking pictures that's really what i want to do not worry about the, the car or do other things um and i i think that the worlds you built were nice um i think that looks great uh i'm glad to hear that you're 
interested in continuing this because I think like adding those things that you didn't get to like the animations of you know the bugs moving around and stuff yeah. and, and the sound like that's what will make the you know the experience like fantastic you know really transportative um but I think it's it's great and I think uh the whole your aim the, at the beginning was for the sleepovers and like having kids come through and do this and I think that's a really um I think it would be really fun for kids to experience and especially this whole like shrinking down and feeling like you're in a you know in a, in a different scale I think all worked really well um uh a question I had I, I so I, when you said in the last slide saying um streamlining the the kind of the the workflow the pipeline um that's something that I th that we hadn't talked about and I think that sounds great like um are you imagining this that there basically could be different adventures you go on um at yeah uh -huh. so, micro or would it be uh what are you thinking so yeah i've been thinking for i mean yeah thanks thanks again for uh liking the idea so uh this is uh more of a so it just treat this as like a boilerplate or like a tool for uh virtual experiences and then you can actually integrate this with uh, other exhibitions so it's not just only uh, the insects uh, museum so it'll be expanding to like different parts of the museum and it will showcase different experiences different artifacts like different uh, animals so yeah that's what I've been thinking so yeah I think that's really fun mm -hmm. thanks oh uh <laughs> I, I'm not a, I was not a part of the client team, but I, I'm a develop, VR developer. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, and I, we have kind of prototype similar to this, but our uh, prototype was, it was also like highlighting the insect, but we used the CT scan of the insect. And oh, uh -huh. I, I like the fact that like, one thing I really like about your uh, production process was you had a lot of thoughts on uh, onboarding process because that's I understand that's very challenging yeah like you know like so how to communicate like how to use the controls and even before you experience uh, the main content like how to get them on board so that's like really big question for all the VR developers and how to communicate that language so I really appreciate that you touched on that part and not only touching that you try to design and you try to come up with different design ideas so I, I really appreciate that part. And also it's amazing that you're only one person and developing everything. So I see <laughs> a lot of work there and yeah. And, yeah, and also a lot of uh, the game assets that you try to like put some thoughts on, like some, like a hat design, like having different hats for different avatars to differentiate different users. So like all of that. So I see there are a lot of potential for this project. So I hopefully you continue work on this and just build more stuff. and please do user testing because there will be some messy situation mm -hmm. once you invite first time users, for example. And I don't know if you're targeting to have multi-user, but it will be nice to have like shared VR experience because especially for this one, like exploring the same insect, like in the same scale and seeing the same thing in VR together and talking to each other, they'll be very satisfying. I see there are a lot of potential as a multiplayer VR experience here. Yeah, so great job. And I and everything makes sense to me, like the the like taking photos and stuff. So great job. All right, thank you. Uh hey Adlin, it's Deborah. Uh -huh. Um Hi. so I uh, I it looks super fun. It looks really, really great. And I think that the actually the idea of having it integrate more with the ins with the insectarium as sort of like a prelude uh and the teaser for the insectarium is a great idea. So my my comments are mostly going to be about content for thinking about how it could integrate better from a content perspective with the insectarium. So first, I really like the idea of the different worlds, but the way that you are conceiving of the different worlds is sort of based on landscape and where they are. So it's like sort of like grass area and, uh, and flower garden and things like that. And in the insectarium, we think about it a little bit more in terms of ecosystem so that you might want to think about it more that way way so that you might have like uh, more of a you know a jungle a tropical ecosystem a desert ecosystem a, a temperate ecosystem and then within each one of those you could pick sort of like a different 
area. So even for like tropical, you could actually do like tree canopy. Um, although I guess you couldn't drive up into the tree canopy, but maybe people are then zip lining and photographing as they're zip lining or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's that's one thing to think about. And then I was I was excited to hear Brett mention that you had been thinking about animation because I think animation would be really great because one of the other things that we really are focusing on in the insectarium is the different roles that insects play in their ecosystems. So to be able to show them not just perched, but actually engaged in um, pollinating or decomposing or um, building a nest, things like that would be a great compliment so that, you know, and then actually that might be more of a, of a challenge to the player because the insect will be in motion and you have to snap good photos of them while they're in motion. Um, and then I guess my question was about the little content cards, right? That uh, the little text that appears when you take the photo. Um, because at least the way you were showing it in the walkthrough, you know, as soon as you take, as soon as the photo is ready, that little text appears, but then the photos are sort of dropped and piled up on the table. And so there's, you know, it's always sort of a question of how do you make the experience both fun and educational? So the way that it was just sort of appearing in the walkthrough is like there wasn't really a lot of time to read that content. So I guess my question to you is, are you envisioning that there could be a moment at the end of the world where you, like I know that you can like potentially email yourself the photos, but maybe in the experience itself where you would actually be able to like see the gallery of the photos that you have, all the photos you've taken, not just piled up, you know, on the table. And then maybe even be able to tap and flip them so that you could actually have a moment to actually experience that content. Um, I think it's it's certainly something that's tricky, but it's something to think about because it's not uh, it's a, it's not, it's not as effective to have you know the photo come out with the content and then it just goes to the side. It's sort of a question of do you just remove that content and let it just be the immersive experience of experiencing the different kinds of insects and what they're doing in the environment. Or if you do want to provide that layer of extra content, how do you do it in a way that um, people will actually have a better chance of wanting to read it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, you know, it's certainly something that we are always thinking about. People don't love to read, they like to experience. Um, but, you know, we, we do want them to at least know, you know, like what is the species, what is the role the species plays. So, you know, it's, it, so it's try, you know, to think about that as you keep working on it. Um, for for how you might give access to that content in um, in a way where people might be more inclined to actually um, dig into it a little bit, mm -hmm. but otherwise it looks great. Hey, thanks. So um, yeah, I also been uh, thinking of uh, so and so when you send uh, emails as when you send your pictures to your email, so mm -hmm. there's like a small basket in the in the car and then you just put all the images that you want to be sent uh, to your email mm -hmm. and then in your email you will have like like a log like a list of log of insects that you've uh, you've taken pictures and then there, there's also like the facts behind them so you okay. don't lose the information that you've uh, taken so you mm -hmm. still have the facts and still going to be like intrigued by the pictures and then the facts behind it so mm -hmm. yeah that's, that's for the next plan. So, so then you may actually want to think about, do you need to show those facts in the moment when you're taking the photo? Like if you're going to get them in the email anyway, maybe they just live in the email. It's just something to think about since you're not, since you're so busy taking photos, you're not really going to have time to actually read the facts there. And then that maybe is then like a little bonus content that you get in the email. It's like, oh, I didn't just get my photos. I got the information also. It's just something to think about. Okay, yeah. We also talked about, with Adeline talking about doing a voiceover instead, mm -hmm. so that it just kind of like reads to you the content so that you, you, you'd you have to like plug your ears to ignore it. <laughs> well, it's funny. It could be like, you know, Richard Attenborough style. Like, you know, I was yeah. just, I was just watching. I don't know if you have seen um, any of the videos made by Zay Frank, the true facts the animal videos, which are done sort of as a parody of Richard Attenborough, but they're su they're they're completely true, uh, mostly true, but they're very, very funny. So, I mean, that, that could be like an added fun layer to have that narration. Mm -hmm. 
kind yeah. of having some of the same exact thoughts. I just thought like, I'm totally impressed you did this by yourself. I can't believe it. I love the low poly aesthetic. It reminds me of like Minecraft or Roblox, or like you said, Pokemon Snap. Um, it's a, a beautiful, immersive experience. Um, it's, it's so beautiful that like, I would rather like, keep looking around and taking pictures than paying attention to that text um, because I wouldn't want to like miss something, I guess. Um, so yeah, like sound was was something I thought of that would work really well or maybe I'm a graphic designer. So like changing the font to be more more clear might encourage people to want to read that information. Um, but I'm also thinking like, you're right, like the the email I think can handle most of what we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I'll jump in with a few comments too. I, I agree with everything that's been said, Ablin. It's really a impressive amount of work. And I think it's a great use of the platform VR. And I think sometimes that, you know, a lot of us, it, on this call are game, NYU Game Center students. And I think we're always thinking, what's the new gameplay? What's the new gameplay? But I love it that you've shamelessly borrowed from Pokemon Snap because that it's so appropriate for VR. It's so appropriate for this context for shrinking you down and 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 kind of reusing that uh, core mechanic in a new way. Um, I think it's really great. I, I um, It is great that you're thinking about the onboarding process. I would I would think about uh, making sure that everybody has to take one picture in order for the game to start so that you just are 100% sure that they know how to take a picture. So they have to take a picture of the instructions, for example. And that's that's what that's what launches them. That's a small detail, but I think that that, that opening is really important. Mm -hmm. I agree, the facts, the facts for the insects, they are one of the big design issues. And I think it's interesting that all four of the projects are wrestling with that. It's one of these great classic challenges of, of, of things where you have the intersection of player games and learning and education is what do you do with that? I think all of the projects handle factual information in different ways. Some of them have challenges. I think actually the Rover, the Rover project is also a little unintegrated. The, I think the best, the best use of information in a game or play context is when you put it to use. Can, how can you put it to use? So for example, in, in your game, in Snap Odyssey, um, what if, for example, you were given a mission at the beginning or three missions and they were, you take pictures of predator insects or take pictures of an insect that, um, you know, is, is of this genus or species or, or, or lives in this area or does this activity and then maybe a little bit of hints. And so then you're, you're kind of given one kind of piece of factual information. Okay, a predator insect, insect eating another insect, like what would they look like? What? And, and then at the end, you know, the information that you get is connects back to the beginning so that it says, oh, well you, yes, this was a predator, but this one wasn't, you know? And I know that's a little bit more interface. You'd want to see, you want the missions very simple so that you could just have them as say two or three things at the bottom um, of the screen that, that are persistent. But then I think that would make the factual information so much more meaningful because you're actually putting it to use in the context of the game. And then in the output at the end, because I agree that that seeing those facts at the end would be good, it connects back to the missions. You you still would end up with cool photos anyway, right? So even if you didn't take a photo of a predator insect, it could say, "Here's one that you missed. You missed this one, you know, because this is how it's a predator." But I think I think overall, um, these are these are these are details as a prototype um, solo project. I think that it's uh, yeah, it's really work well done. Really really good design thinking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's try to integrate with uh, like the fact finding as well for the facts uh, for the tasks as well. So for example, it's like one of the tasks, like it doesn't really tell you like the animal that you're, or the insect that you're taking, but it's like find an insect that like there's only a day and then just take pictures of that and then right. find out. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if I could just jump in and build on what Eric just said, um, I, I think that that's a great idea to sort of like give you a little bit of focus and it absolutely reinforces what I was saying before about thinking about the different roles that insects play, right? And it's a way of 
of teaching them what is a pollinator, right, without having to go into a lot of text and a lot of narration about it. But, you know, to just say, you know, look for insects that are collecting pollen on flowers, right? It all it tells you right there. It's like, okay, what do the, what does the, the butterfly and the bee and these other insects have in common? So I think that that, that, that is a really interesting thing to think about to sort of like organize your photo taking a little bit around different types of insects or different roles that they have in their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much. One more round of applause for uh, Snap Odyssey Micro Expeditions. <laughs> Uh, I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, coming today. Uh, specifically, I want to thank uh, the faculty and staff from the NYU Game Center. Uh, I want to thank the staff from the museum for uh, not just being here today, but their support throughout the semester. And uh, mostly, I want to thank the students for uh, staying so committed to do this and doing such a great job on their projects uh, through very difficult circumstances. So uh, if everyone can unmute and do one like collective round of applause. Um, Matt, can I say that I've, I've been to several of these museum, uh, uh, designing for museum uh, classes in the, in the final credits. Great to see some of the Museum folks that I that I get to see at the at these moments, but I think that this is hands down the strongest set of projects. I think that that these are four really solid projects. They 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 seem very real, right? They're not just concepts, but they seem generally they're they're actually playable prototypes and apps. So it's it's really impressive. I think there's smart design thinking in all four, and and uh, and I, I think that it's it's fabulous. I could see any. And I could see all of them being integrated into the museum uh, experience quite easily. So anyway, great work, everybody. And congrats to you too, Matt. Thank you, Eric. One last round of applause. Anyone else, any last comments, anyone before we sign off? And thank you all again. And thank you for those of you who are tuning in to the YouTube live stream or who are watching it later on YouTube live. Uh, really appreciate your, uh, your tuning in for this and supporting the students. So thank you again, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>